So thanks to everyone who's joined us for today's webinar on uh, AS3850. My name is Sarah Backman and I'm the Chief Executive of National Precast. As those of you who are watching today will know who are members, uh, you'll know that we run these uh, webinars about once a fortnight and they're either on technical topics or they're on legal topics that relate to precast manufacturing specifically. And those webinars are actually included in the membership for, for our members, as well as the, that, met, that uh, benefit. There are a whole lot of other, other benefits of becoming a member. We have um, members have access to standards. Um, we've got our own internship program. We have a series of networking events and conferences, uh, online learning, and we're very active in the advocacy space as well. Um, if you are interested in membership and you're not a member, I encourage you to have a look at our website uh, under the membership tab. Uh, otherwise, get in touch with me. My details are on the, um, on the website under the About Us uh, section. So today, as you're aware, we're running this webinar on AS3850, the standard Australian standard for prefabricated concrete elements. Um, and uh, it's a standard that comes in three parts. Um, which our speakers today will go into detail on. Um, we have three presenters. All of these three presenters are actually um, committee members of BD66, which is the standards committee responsible for AS3850. And all three have been on that committee for quite some time. Between them, they've got a wealth of knowledge on precast. Um, so the three speakers are, as you, as you are aware, Simon Hughes from Precast Concepts, Steve Roach, um, who's representing the ACTU and the CFMEU, and Rod Mackay-Sim from Hillside Engineering. They're going to cover the evolution of the standard and they're going to go into detail about the three sections of the standard and they're going to pull out the most important bits that you should know about under the standard as many of you will know, AS3850 Part 3 is a newer addition to the series. Uh, AS3850 Part 3 covers civil construction and Part 2 covers uh, buildings construction. So on that note, um, just before we get going, questions please at the top of your screen. If you hover at the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section. If you can send through any questions you have through that Q&A um, uh, facility and we will deal with the questions at the end of the webinar. We expect it to go for about an hour. Um, so please enjoy the uh, enjoy the webinar and I'll now hand over to our first presenter, Simon Hughes. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Well, thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us today for a brief overview of some of the work that we have been doing on developing AS3850. As most of you will be aware, AS3850 has been broken into parts with parts one and two released in 2015. And part three titled Civil Construction released last year. As part of this presentation, the aim is to give everyone an overview of the standard. First, with a brief history of how this standard has evolved. Then a quick review of parts one and two before we have a closer look at the new part three of the standard. But before we start, this is just a reminder of what can go wrong and the reason that these documents have been written. The aim and the focus of this suite of documents is to do everything possible to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen. Through the presentation, Steve will also show a few practical examples of why certain clauses and commentary have also been included in the standard. So first, a brief history of how AS3850 has evolved over the years. <clears throat> Excuse me. As most of you will be aware, this is not the first version of AS3850. The original version was released in 1990 and was primarily focused on precast and tilt-up factory wall panels. In 2003, an updated version was released. However, this was specifically written around the use of tilt-up panels only, and for many years became the default standard for not only all precast panel projects, 
but also for precast structure projects as there was no other local standard available at that time. This, along with a number of safety critical issues and ambiguities in the 2003 version, resulted in a committee with a wide range in participation to, in essence, rewrite a new standard, creating a document that would be more usable and relevant to the industry that was using it. A significant part of this process was used to align Safe Work Australia's National Code of Practice, which unfortunately was never published. The release of part two saw the first Australian standard that was not only for precast wall panels, but allowed for all components for precast for full precast structures. This release was such a significant change that it required parts one and two to be issued for public top comment twice. Now with part three being the first Australian standard for precast in civil and infrastructure projects. While civil products have been excluded from all previous revisions, during the drafting of the 2015 oh, version, sorry, seem to have a bit of a delay going with the slide transition. There we go. Sorry, so while civil products have been excluded from all previous revisions, during the drafting of the 2015 version, the standard was structured and it was always the intent to enable this future inclusion. Also following a death in Western Australia, the coroner demanded that an amendment be made to include for civil products. A focus of all three parts, but particularly parts two and three, is to provide guidance to erection design engineers, particularly now that it is a requirement on all precast projects. Having the alignment with the National Code of Practice meant that the two documents would work in harmony with the standard being the technical document and the code being the how-to document. However, this standard differs from most in that we have included as much commentary as possible to provide guidance and reasoning for many of the requirements. The real key to these documents is to ensure that projects are considered not only prior to arriving on site, but prior to manufacture. As we've seen, the majority of accidents that have occurred in our industry have been due to ad hoc decisions being made on site without adequate consideration. Now, all projects must have the full erection documentation, including rigging, on site prior to any installation commencing. I think this is where I, uh, I come into it, uh, Simon. Yes, it is. Little, uh, little background on the guidance material, which it all is, um, from, uh, from the perspective of uh, um, having easy to read, under easily understood guidance material out there. Uh, we're covering Victoria, and, uh, along with the CFMEU and other industry players, uh, got together and, and produced the Victorian industry standard for precast and tilt up for buildings. Um, and... That was effectively the template by which they developed the national code at a later time. There's some little subtle differences, but um, in essence, it's, it's generally much the same thing. So we had a fairly consistent approach. Now, most, state, uh, most states will have um, a code at the state level. Um, I know South Australia have in the past. I think they still do. I, I know Queensland do, and I'm pretty sure Western Australia does too. Um, but I think it's incumbent, you know, that we uh, we, we organise to have them all in harmony as uh, as best can be done for the um, for the stability of the industry. Nonetheless, that's the background to um, to the guidance material. Um, the guidance material just doesn't include codes of practice and standards. It also Australian standards is regarded as guidance material, and uh, as our many of the safety alerts at the unions or the employer groups or the uh, relevant work cover authority will produce from time to time too. So if we go to the next sli slide there, Simon. I'll... Now, uh, one of the issues I had 10 years ago when I first got involved in this sector was um, uh, trying to crystallise the, 
the nature of the relationships with the various players and uh, the Victorian Work Cover Authority, um, uh, their engineering unit put out this very handy um, flow chart, if you like, of responsibilities and the different players in it. And, um, and it was really to try and get a better understanding uh, for all industry players of the nature of what is regarded as a hazardous, a hazardous industry. So it was very important that um, people get that understanding. The, the new part three, um, uh, the committee had a great deal of discussion about the definitions and it's really been broadened out. Uh, and we've made it crystal clear that, uh, that uh, erection design engineers must be engaged and not just at the uh, start of the precast, they've, they've got to be engaged prior to that. They've got to, they've got to confirm and approve the shop drawings. They've got to be able to understand not only how an element goes in situ, but how you get it there and how you get it there safely. And um, I think if people engage the right people from the very start, then they should have a minimum of trouble as, as we move through. The second point I wanted to make with this slide is in relation to documentation. There's an appalling lack of knowledge about the nature of the documentation that's essential. For any erection crew worth their salt, the shop drawings are the most important thing for them to have on site, signed off by the approving engineer prior to seeking to erect any precast or prefabricated concrete elements. And the, um, the problem is if the documentation isn't on site or if, if it isn't the right documentation or if it hasn't been signed off by an erection design engineer or it lacks many of the uh, critical uh, bits of information needed, I'll, I'll make mention of further, further along today, but if it lacks information or it's not correct or the rigging diagram provided, it can't be done because somebody hasn't thought out how they're going to rotate it into place, um, then we're heading down a road of having a major incident and incidents in this industry do not lead to a stub toe or a, um, you know, a Band-Aid on the finger. We're talking about a very real chance of, um, of a death and um, destruction uh, of, a major, of a major event. If I go to the next, uh, next slide, I think, oh, we're back to you, Simon. Now, this is Rhodes. Rob. Good afternoon, everybody. Look, it's unusual for me to be on mute, um, so people tell me. Um, that's a good uh, little introduction. Um, part one is a common standard uh, for all of the subsequent standards, part two and part three. And part one deals with the requirements for the uh, manufacturers and suppliers of the equipment used in prefabricated concrete construction. So it specifies what the minimum safety requirements are uh, and ensures that uh, people, when they're making these uh, products and selling them into the market, uh, have uh, designed them correctly and tested them. So uh, as you'll see on the screen here, uh, there are requirements for lifting anchors. Um, there are special requirements for um, the material properties to ensure that they've got the right sort of uh, uh, strength and ductility, which you require for lifting. Um, the clutches themselves uh, for doing the lifting. Uh, these um, are multi-use items. They have a higher factor of safety than the single-use, well, limited-use uh, anchors. Um, and importantly, the standard sets out uh, minimum testing requirements, which are for each clutch, not for a batch of clutches, but every individual clutch must be proof loaded uh, to twice its working load, and it must be subjected to a crack uh, uh, checking test uh, by magnetic uh, particle testing. Um, in addition, there are traceability requirements because from time to time, uh, accidents do happen. Um, uh, engineering materials, unfortunately, uh, whilst we endeavour to make sure that they uh, uh, contain no defects, will from time to time uh, contain a defect. Uh, it's not to say that that defect is a critical defect, but from time to time there is one. Uh, so if there is a failure at any stage, the manufacturer and supplier must be able to trace that back to the manufacturing batch uh, and then take steps to ensure that the remainder of the products in that batch are not similarly affected. 
For post installed brace anchors, and we'll talk about those a little later, uh, there are special requirements uh, for the testing of the post installed uh, brace anchors. Um, thankfully, since around about 1990, when the first AS3850 uh, standard was brought in and uh, there were uh, requirements made to uh, ensure that cyclic loading and the slip that, that, that it produces in fixings uh, was addressed um, and limited. Thankfully, the many accidents that happened with uh, failures before that time uh, have been avoided by the provisions in AS3850. Um, there's a new um, uh, standard uh, which has come out uh, in more recent times for fixings, which is uh, under the uh, Australian standard AS5216. And as yet, that does not contain uh, the cyclic load testing, tension load testing that's contained in AS3850 Part 1, Appendix B, uh, because um, the, the 5216 is aligned to European fixing standards, um, but it will come and um, there will be uh, inclusions uh, in that standard in the future for cyclic load testing for this type of application. For casting insets, inserts, which are commonly used for uh, fixing and for uh, attachment of uh, temporary supports, uh, there are requirements now on uh, the maximum grade of uh, bolt, uh, which is required after there have been many failures of people installing these um, fixings with overstrength bolts um, and then uh, getting gorillas to uh, uh, stand on uh, uh, big drills and um, uh, impact hammers until they uh, break the insert. In the end, something has to fire, and unfortunately the poor little insert or the concrete surrounding it is a thing that may fail uh, if it's overstrength. So there are, the committee's recommended that uh, the maximum tensile strength be of a 4.6 bulk. For edge lift anchors, the requirements were introduced in 2015 after following accidents to ensure that each of those, those uh, edge lift inserts is fitted with a tension bar. This improves uh, both its ultimate strength capability uh, and also provides uh, an additional load path uh, and ensures that there's some redundancy in that lifting anchor in the case that uh, there might be poor compaction around the anchor or some other um, uh, issue. Uh, as we've mentioned, lifting clutches uh, should be 100% uh, particle, uh, magnetic particle tested. Uh, one of the problems with uh, uh, looking at clutches, and here's a clutch which has failed, of a typical one, um, Sorry to say that it's made by uh, an unknown manufacturer somewhere in Asia um, to some um, uh, material requirement that obviously doesn't meet the uh, application. This is a brittle failure, uh, typical of a material that's been uh, poorly uh, controlled for chemistry or for heat treatment or for both. Uh, and uh, sadly, there have been many of these failures and the mag particle testing doesn't uh, catch these. The only uh, requirement that you have to ensure that you can avoid this type of thing is to buy your products from the people who actually designed them rather than uh, some uh, importer uh, from somewhere in China or some other place uh, that has little idea about what these things are supposed to be uh, uh, for and has just copied something else. Um, for post installed brace anchors, um, we, as I've said, we're working with AS5216. And uh, for casting inserts, as I've said, uh, again, um, these poor quality uh, casting inserts, again, have been supplied by uh, suppliers in Australia, uh, in good faith, perhaps, uh, but looking for the cheapest uh, source overseas. And they found the cheap ones, and unfortunately, they fire. I think this is... Uh, self-explanatory braces uh, now require uh, anti-tampering um, requirements. This was in 2015. Uh, all braces used for supporting uh, prefabricated concrete elements have to be tested, and there are testing requirements set out in Appendix A of AS3850 Part 1. And the testing of the braces is not just uh, in, in, in one direction. It's at a specified angle, inclined angle, typical of the type of angle of, in service. Uh, this is important because braces may well fail by strut failure if they are uh, loaded eccentrically and there's always some degree of eccentric loading in these sort of applications. 
uh, shims, there's some requirement on shims, um, and uh, those that uh, supply these shims uh, uh, should ensure that they comply with the testing requirements in, in Appendix um, uh, of 3850 Part 1. I think it's over to you now, is that not, Simon? It is. So while Part 1 is focused on what the component producers must satisfy, Part two is aimed at the erection design engineer. Part two has been written to closely align with the National Code of Practice, but most important, importantly, clearly defines the roles and responsibilities of both the in-service and erection designers. It is written to assist the erection designer through the process, and unlike most standards, has a significant amount of commentary to provide practical advice and detail. Rather than focusing on the individual bits that go into or onto the precast element, part two focuses on the whole precast component and the structure and what needs to be considered at each stage of that component's life. Looking at the interrelation of the various stages of manufacture, construction, transport, right through to the erection and incorporation into the final structure. Part two provides guidance and clarity around the various factors that need to be considered throughout a precast element's life. Expanding the considerations from not only precast and tilt-up panels, but through to a variety of different component types that are used within various precast structures. And while Rod mentioned in part one, the testing of braces more accurately reflects the real world worst case scenario Part two provides much more detail on the considerations for the erection designer, such as the impacts of an eccentric load through the brace foot on the brace fixing. The standard provides a lot more commentary and guidance around the stability of not only the individual element, but on the structure as it is being erected. And as it covers all precast elements in building construction, understanding the difference between temporary support of both vertical elements using braces, and the support of horizontal components using props. Specific details around footings and the different con considerations around permanent and temporary footings, but also to ensure that the ground conditions are considered with geotechnical reports required and specific guidance around things such as wet, sandy or poorly compacted ground and the possible application of uplift forces. A complete section on transport, craneage and erection. Section four includes a lot of detail around the erection checklist with guidance and commentary around craneage and rigging, as well as the importance of inspection and element assessment prior to lifting, ensuring that the method of lifting and the rigging configuration is not guessed on site, but clearly specified. Sections five and six highlight many of the safety critical activities particularly around checking the correct tightening torques on brace fixings and ensuring checking and sign off before the removal of any temporary support. Over to you, Steve. You're on mute. Yep. I've just got it. I thought it was my turn. Um, okay. I've... Um, I just want to address uh, a number of the changes that were adopted for part three that we're looking to review and um, uh, as, as appropriate flow back to part two. Um, uh, there was very little mention of test cylinders formally and there seems to be a great misunderstanding throughout the industry as to what the purpose of having test cylinders for is for in the first place. If your test cylinders are there to determine the compressive strength of the concrete uh, at a particular point in time from the time it was poured, then it must be maintained, those cylinders must be maintained in the identical condition to the slab that's being tested for concrete age strength. Uh, a lot of people uh, seem to get wrapped up in the uh, design strength uh, test which, uh, you know, where the uh, a fellow will come along from the test agency and take the cylinders away and put them in a bath out the back and uh, for optimum condition or whatever. 
but that is not to determine the age strength of the concrete. That's only to determine the design strength after or, or its 28 day or 56 day strength. So we make it a, a lot clearer uh, in the new part three and, and hopefully uh, part two following its review that the test cylinders for determination of age strength of the concrete being tested will require the cylinders to be maintained in the same condition as the slab. The other issue here that uh, I wanted to raise, um, I think we better explain the issue of the talking of fasteners because there seems to be, uh, with, with these rattle guns that are being used out on site now, I mean, they're, they're, they're being produced at uh, ratings up to 1,500 newton metres. Uh, most people don't appreciate that cast-in ferrules are generally rated about 146 newton metres max and that really, to do justice to the ferrule, you, you can spin the, 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 the bolt in, but you really need to complete the installation with a calibrated torque wrench to ensure that you do not go beyond that, um, that rating and uh, I'd suggest would be some, somewhere well back. The other issues, inspection prior to casting, have been moved. Uh, can we go back with Simon? I'll just... Yeah. Uh, inspection prior to casting, um, uh, failure to, to have a proper QA inspection has led to a number of elements um, uh, resulting in lift to pull out or resulting in, for example, with this particular picture, uh, delaminating of stitch plates from the... Uh, from the um, uh, the, the panels that are being used to attach an awning to. In this particular case, uh, they were still attaching the roofing to the awning and um, and the uh, plates just delaminated from their, well, what they were cast into. Uh, on investigation precast, they hadn't put in tension bars behind the, uh, the plates and there'd been no proper QA set up to pick it up. And that could have killed 100 people had, had that held for the meantime, and then what happens when an awning gets wet? Well, about doubles in weight. And what happens when people are in a mall? They run under the awning. It could have been a major disaster. And that was uh, a failure to have a QA system in place, a, a failure to manufacture properly. And um, and as a result, the, these elements are coming out of the site. They're a blind commodity. And, uh, you know, if the paperwork indicates it's all okay, but, but that it's not okay, you can have a major incident. If we can go to the next photo, uh, this this was a lift to pull out. This is a shocking accident that happened in uh, August uh, 2011, um, where the only thing that really saved the crane operator was that the braces dug into the ground and stopped the panel from swinging over and taking off the cabin of the crane. Uh, the rigger in this incident lost his thumb as his, his, his hand got caught in the chain as it... Uh, violently swung around after the lift that pulled out. And the investigation was that they, the, the normal guy that does the QA at that precaster's premises uh, wasn't in. They put a labour hire guy in. He didn't know what he was doing. Uh, the, the, the wrong bar went through the wrong hole and so on and so forth. Well, it, it led to a disaster and it should have been picked up by a proper QA system. And it should well, it shouldn't have occurred in the first place because the people doing that work should have been properly trained. That's something that we're sadly lacking. Um, element checks prior to lifting again. It's, this is a critical uh, part of the you know the erection crew's role. Is firstly to get the shop drawing, have a good look at it, look at the critical areas of the lifters, uh, what. What they're rated at, they're working load limit, who the manufacturer is, make sure you get the right clutches. Do you need spreader beams? Do you need snatch blocks? What are you going to need on site that day to make it all go like clockwork? And if the information that's being provided on that shop drawing is correct and the rigging diagram that's provided is correct and it's all been assessed and signed off by the approving uh, engineer, the erection design engineer, then it should go up like clockwork. The incidents that we're having are happening nearly always because of a failure in the provision of information and a failure from the people involved on site to have a proper pre-start meeting to evaluate all this information and to develop swims for the uh, hazardous uh, aspects of the job. Swims being safe work method start. Where 
well, this is a classic example of what happens when you rig something wrong and uh, it ended up just folding up. A lot of panels that are being, uh, being asked to be manufactured these days have all sorts of funny door openings or windows or whatever. They're not just a straight uh, block of uh, concrete and steel. And as a result, a lot of computations are needed and a good assessment for the uh, rigging and the lifting requirements. Uh, however, if the builder hasn't even bothered to provide the approved shop drawing to the erection crew prior to the panel being lifted, then they are not doing their job and they are as equally responsible as somebody who made the mistake in the rigging. If you can't expect so some of these guys, they get the site, that they come in, if they haven't had a proper evaluation of what they're going to lift that day, apart from not having the right equipment on the job, um, uh, you can have all sorts of things go wrong. And, uh, and then people come to you later and say, well, I've been doing it for 30 years and I've never had that before. Well, you know, maybe they were lucky. If the information had been provided by the builder in this case, and if they had have engaged an erection design engineer instead of... Uh, oh, well, the precaster does a, 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 a race design and they think they've done everything. Well, that, this is the sort of stuff that happens. Again, this is another case. Um, I didn't actually take these photos. They were provided. I think, Simon, you, you had these, but they, uh, again, show the consequences of a failure in the rigging configuration. Um, if you go to the next one. So we put out all these sort of OHS alerts, safety alerts, whatever you want uh, want to call them. But um, we, we do that, we try to point to the critical stuff about it, but really it comes down to the people on site. As a safety officer in a union, I cannot burn all sites at all times, nor can, nor can anyone else, and that's why we need to better educate people who are doing the hands-on work in this sector to get a better appreciation Firstly, of what they're doing, and secondly, the other the other chains in that sector, from uh, manufacturing through transport, storage, erection, and incorporation in the final structure. So if we go to the next one, oh, we're back to you, is it, Rod? Or is it, it is. Fine? It is. It is. So, uh, mate, I'll be back shortly. Oh, thank you. So, we've all had a bit of a taste of what can go wrong. Uh, if we don't uh, design it properly, uh, document it properly, and then build it properly. Uh, lots of things can go wrong, and, and precast, prefabricated concrete uh, is unforgiving if you're underneath it and it comes down. So while Simon said that at the outset, civil products were excluded from AS3850, um, uh, partly because at the time it was viewed that it was too complicated to um, in incorporate all these separate elements. Um, it was always the intention of the committee to actually uh, provide a part dedicated to uh, civil construction. And this is the part, part three, which was released last year. Um, it is in similar format to part two because essentially it's an erection document. It's an erection design document, um, but aimed uh, more towards uh, the civil construction uh, industry. And although it does follow a similar format, uh, we have changed, we took the opportunity in revising um, this document and building this document to revise uh, many of the design parts in, which would be then adopted in part two as well. So part three actually is the most up-to-date um, document in terms of design, that is section two in particular. Um, and it's applicable to both, um, both areas of construction. So next slide, please, Simon. Next slide. Coming. So part three, as I've said, is aimed at um, all sorts of products which we see out in civil construction, uh, including um, tubular products, pipes and poles, and uh, other objects, uh, columns and uh, bridge beams and bridge planks and box culverts and everything that you might have on a civil uh, construction site. And of course, it can include uh, wall panels because there are sometimes uh, applications for wall panels. So uh, 
part three has to cover a very, very wide range of different products. And, and the committee was uh, endeavoured to, to make sure that we didn't uh, leave any orphans out um, and to, to as far as possible to try and include everything that we could think of. Um, if we've left something out and somebody would like to make a suggestion, please let us know. Well, the fact that accidents happen in civil construction is well known. Uh, the previous slide uh, showed the, um, uh, a terrible accident uh, up in, in Queensland uh, where somebody, these people dug a pit and then thought it was a sensible idea just to uh, uh, lower the panels down onto to make the sides of the pit and embrace them with, with a brace that they had handy, didn't even bother to, uh, uh, to fasten it. And unfortunately, um, uh, one of these panels came down and flattened, I think, at least one person uh, who died underneath it, two people. Um, and this has arisen primarily because um, it wasn't in the purview of, of, you know, the people didn't sort of apply the rules that had already been there for AS3850, um, which was published in 2015, thinking that, oh, well, we don't need it in civil construction. We know what we're doing. As Steve said, uh, we've been doing it for the last 30 years and never had a problem. Um, and this is exactly where accidents happen. And in particular, it happens with uh, large pieces of construction, um, modular construction, as is prefabricated concrete, but it could also uh, happen in steel construction and other uh, construction areas where there are large pieces of, of um, kit which are, uh, have got to be placed. But in precast, we know that we're dealing with large pieces. So it is a hazardous industry if it's not done correctly. Next slide. The impetus and the real um, generator for uh, getting part three uh, up, and, up and going was an accident in, in WA. Um, this was a, 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 a very small, almost insignificant uh, type of product. It was a pit lead, um, as people have been using these for uh, a long time. Uh, never had a problem. Same old, same old. But it showed the, the, the way in which an accident which can be fatal, and this one was, uh, is generally a chain of events. It's not just one thing that goes wrong. And this is what engineers and practitioners, builders, uh, erectors have got to remember, that every piece in the chain has to hold together. And if one little link breaks in that chain, then we're going to have a problem. So that means it's got to be planned properly from the beginning. It's got to be designed properly. It's got to be implemented properly. It's got to be inspected. And then finally, the guy has to be trained and he's got to be going according to the safe work method statement that's, that's already been agreed for the implementation. In this case, there was a whole bunch of things that went wrong. The first thing was that the precaster was left to put the lifting, uh, lifting points in and instead of putting three in which, or four in, which would have provided stability, he was saving money by putting two anchors in there. Um, and then he saved a bit more money by using a... a a recess former, which either he designed or somebody else had designed and sold to him, which could be used for multiple sizes of anchors without realising that part of the design of these lifting systems is that uh, you use um, components which are compatible with each other. So there was an incompatibility between the recess former, which is, surrounds the anchor, and the anchor itself. And then they went out to site at the back of a truck um, and the, the rigger who, who was doing this, a very experienced man, but it was coming lunchtime. And instead of unhooking the chains that he had when he'd been lifting uh, with a, a two and a half ton system, and, and what was in this, in this panel was a two 1.3 ton capacity anchors, he decided, oh, well, I've done it before. I can get away with um, putting these um, two and a half ton clutches on because I've got these bigger recesses. In other words, the precaster had decided to use these bigger recesses because he thought it was a good idea um, to save money for his clients to be able to just use one type of clutch and to fit, the, fit you know, either clutch into this recess. So he was saving money by one recess fits all. Um, then he put the anchors in one, in two anchors in one plane. And then the, 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 the operator uh, got lazy um, it was near lunchtime. He hooked up two and a half ton clutches. The clutches just grabbed. Um, he got it above his head and 
as one could see, when he slewed the crane, the, uh, the, the, the pit um, uh, swung about its axis because it was only supported on these two axis anchors. That uh, engaged the clutch sideways. The clutch came off the anchor, down came the panel, and unfortunately um, killed the operator. And it was later the coroner found that the, the unused clutches, the brand new clutch that was sitting in the side sheet that he should have used. So there's a whole bunch of things that should have gone right, but didn't, and it ended in a tragic failure. So the coroner insisted that the AS3850 be extended to uh, civil construction products as one of the outcomes of the coronial inquiry. And, and that led to the AS3850 part three. So one of the most significant changes or modifications is the inclusion of a number of definitions in the document with probably the most significant being the definition of what is a professional engineer and what is a competent person. These defined competencies are set out in Appendix B in which all of the safety critical roles that are now mandatory are defined, including the component design, which includes the design of the lifting inserts, clutches, fixing inserts, bracing componentry, which will include mechanical, structural and material design. The erection design, which includes the design for the erection of the temporary support and precast elements and shall be by a professional engineer. The in-service design, product specific design, which is the design of standard precast elements, including the in-service design and shall be by a professional engineer. The precasting inspection includes conducting or supervising inspections during the manufacture of precast elements and rigging, which shall be undertaken by a competent person with a license to perform this high risk work. So as you can see, the document not only clearly defines numerous roles, but details that familiarity and relevant safety information, suitable training and in certain areas, specific qualifications and experience that is required to carry out these tasks. But also new to this document is the introduction of the terms project specific elements and non-project specific elements. This new introduction is specifically related to the difference between the civil and building market. For example, pipes and pits are produced as a product and not specifically for any particular project. These types of elements have different requirements and responsibilities, particularly around the preparation of shop drawings and marking plans, but still require a designer to detail things such as the lifting and handling information, specified concrete and the like. The design section of the document has also been completely revised, reorganized and edited for easier navigation. This section now includes such things as the inclusion of a table detailing when to apply the various load factors to an element, a reduction on the maximum sling angle now reduced from 120 to 90 degrees, mould adherence or suction values that allow forces for different mould configurations to be estimated, as well as the inclusion of a new lifting design procedure in Appendix C, and all of the guidance rigging diagrams now move to a new Appendix D. To greatly assist the design process, a new Appendix C has been included. This appendix is a step-by-step -step guide to the considerations that need to be made and the loads and factors that need to be included in the analysis of a precast element during the lifting and handling process. And while part two included many rigging diagrams of various configurations for precast element used in building construction, part three has been expanded and includes a number of new rigging diagrams to reflect the lifting and handling of many typical civil elements. To simplify the use of the document, all of the rigging diagrams have been moved into a new Appendix D, with these rigging diagrams ordered by number and type of lifting points. There's also improved clarity around bracing and propping.
with new diagrams included. This section also includes further detail around things like temporary bracing that must allow for any and all superimposed loads, along with stability checks, including construction loads like in situ pores and backfilling, as well as any eccentricities. The requirement for brace removal procedures, including the staging of the removable, removal, all to be fully detailed and documented within the erection design and all ensuring overall structural stability prior to brace removal. Details around the requirements for a robust method of providing lateral stability for the vertical propping of horizontal elements and a new inclusion for elements that require temporary support that are subject to combined vertical and horizontal loads. Footings have also been expanded with further clarity and guidance around the use of permanent footings that are used for temporary support, including consideration of the packer selection, new requirements for temporary supports using dead men and the design of mass blocks, particularly for on-ground mass blocks, ensuring that there is a method of lateral restraint included, as well as requirements for the strength and testing of concrete at the time of bracing to include consideration for all temporary and permanent fixings. Well, as you can see from the previous slide, arising from accidents, we realised that there was insufficient design uh, information to ensure that we had lateral support for those mass blocks and there have been numerous blocks which have uh, blown over, well, panels that have been blown over as the blocks have moved on ground. Um, there's now a reference uh, in a 3850 part three for the design of um, uh, fixings and fastings. Um, and there's, we've given some attention to uh, wet joints. These are uh, uh, biscuits left out for uh, ladder pouring um, because there've been numerous uh, examples of uh, design, under design of these joints leading to uh, failures uh, leading to concrete uh, weeping out through the joints uh, and, other, and other problems. Um, Steve's already covered off, uh, Simon's already covered off on the uh, project specific elements and non project specific elements, but it's an essential part of, of this standard. Uh, another uh, area which we pay particular attention to is after a number of failures have occurred on sites um, is to draw attention to the fact that. Welding on sites is generally not recommended. Uh, so methods of uh, fixing uh, uh, elements together um, other than welding should always be preferred over welding. But if it is required, then we've made requirements uh, that these welds be done in accordance with AS 1554 and that they be inspected and supervised by a qualified um, people um, rather than just sending somebody up with a burner um, and, a, and a stick electrode to whack a bit of um, uh, metal because some of the, the uh, wells uh, that I've seen have, have been uh, people dribbled a welding rod over the, over a, 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 where a requirement for a, um, uh, a structural weld. Um, a general lack of understanding uh, by an engineer who puts uh, that a weld should be an FSB, in other words, a full strength um, uh, structural weld. Um, and... and with no, no other qualification, uh, which leads it open to uh, a contractor to do whatever he feels is um, necessary. You know, he's been doing it for 20 or 30 years and never had a problem. Well, now he will have a problem if it's designed and supervised in accordance with a uh, 3850 part three, and that'll move also into part two, because we want to make sure that if somebody does do a weld, that it's done correctly and it's inspected correctly, and that the engineer has considered all of the factors which uh, a weld uh, will entail, including the use of weld plates and the shrinkage effects that, that, that weld plates um, uh, are subject to, and the fact that many of these weld plates have insufficient um, embedment to really guarantee the tensile forces which may, and, and bending forces to which they may be subjected. So we saw a failure there earlier that Steve put up where these weld plates are just pulled straight out of the, out of the wall. And that's an indication of the fact that that it wasn't properly designed in the first place. And as Steve said, there was certainly no erection designer involved in that project. So nobody's bothered to check to make sure that in fact, these well plates 
uh, were, uh, were, were, were installed correctly or, in fact, that they were appropriate in the first place. So inspecting uh, and inspection has also been given a, a special mention uh, because of the special requirements in many uh, civil precasts for uh, post-tensioning and, and pre-stressing, uh, pre-stress products, uh, and to ensure that uh, those uh, issues which are particular for uh, pre-stressed uh, construction are uh, included in this standard. Thanks. Uh, we've also been given greater consideration to transport and craneage and erection. Um, we've looked at um, the various failures that have occurred uh, over time uh, with storage and handling, um, ensuring that, it, that the rigging systems which are being used are being designed uh, by an erection design engineer and approved and then implemented uh, in accordance with uh, a drawing which is provided to the people on site. And really, the people shouldn't be lifting at all if they don't have a, rig, uh, a rigging diagram. Uh, to be honest, in my opinion, the crane crew should just say, no, we're not lifting until we've got a drawing which has been approved by the erection design engineer. I mean, why would you, why would you think to save um, uh, a buck by uh, uh, thinking that you can outguess uh, the engineers uh, if you are not a competent uh, erection design engineer? You can't. We've got special requirements now for uh, the use of chemical anchors and lifting inserts. And we've also given consideration to special guidance for stacking um, and, and uh, for circular objects. Uh, you can see here in the, the, the diagram on the right, the photo on the right hand side, what happens if you don't get it right? Uh, it's very easy to see panels are stacked up um, um, and, and people don't appreciate that whilst they may be quite stable when they're on the edge, it doesn't make, take much to, to knock them over. And when they do, a little stick or a little piece of uh, angle line is not going to hold up a, a panel that weighs 10 tonnes. It'll flop over just like that. And if it happens on site, somebody might get killed. We've given special attention to temporary supports because this is an area which has been poorly um, uh, addressed in many uh, construction sites that we've seen. Um, and most importantly, and, and a theme throughout AS 3850, is that the, the processes must be designed, and they must be implemented according to the plan, and in the case of all supports, no support should be removed until you've had written approval by the erection design engineer. And we'll see more about that. Uh, we've, as we've said earlier, uh, and Steve has mentioned, we give guidance on torque wrenches, torque settings, for appropriate for uh, inserts, which are used for wind bracing. And again, the limitation of class 4.6 metric volts for cast in bracing inserts. Now, Appendix A in, in part three, it's, 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 it's extended from Appendix A in part two. Um, and it, it's got an extra column on the right hand side. We've uh, revised, which is particularly for the product specific documentation. Now, Appendix A is your best friend. It's your go-to as a checklist for the documentation that you are required to provide for each stage of the process, starting from the structural layout plans, through the shop drawings, what's required for erection. Now, sometimes these drawings can be combined. Uh, it would be cleaner and nicer in many respects to have a separate a layer of just erection design drawings with only the information required for the erection design, uh, rather than having somebody on site with a full set of uh, detailed drop, drop shop drawings, because unfortunately, many people uh, believe that they can second guess and be experts on site when they see something. Um, in, in some ways, it's better to uh, only give them the details that they really need as safety critical details. But in any case, um, those drawings must be available. And Appendix A is your best friend. Now, I have to say here for principal contract, uh, AS3850 is your best friend if you're going to build in prefabricated concrete because AS3850 tells you everything you need to know about the sort of people that you have to employ, i.e. the erection design engineers and all of those people involved in your processes to make sure you do it in a safe manner. So Appendix A should also be a best friend for all those 
um, uh, principal contractors out there, builders who want to get involved in prefabricated concrete. Because this is a template to say what's got to be documented. And if you are the owner or the builder of, of a prefabricated concrete construction, it's on you to make sure that this documentation uh, is accessible on site in particular when it's a record. Back to me, a couple of bad war stories. Um, look, I, uh, I threw these pickies in just as examples. To, to be fair to the builder in the, uh, in the case of the photo on the left, that uh, mass concrete block wasn't the sole. Uh, they, it, I was told by the builder that actually tied in, but he maintained them there as a secondary sort of support. Well, look, the reason I put the photo in was to just point out some of the classic, uh, and I have seen them used in this way uh, out in the wild, wild west, um, where, you know, we need, well, we needed to get a little bit of, um, uh, you know, some minimum requirements on the use of those sort of blocks and some clear instruction on how to be used. And I think we do that. You saw that in earlier slides that uh, Rod had put up. Uh, but again, see at the top of this particular block, it was like Swiss cheese. Been used a million times. Um, it may not have been 4.8 ton by the time I photographed it. It might have had, uh, you know, to, might have had a bit of drill out too. But um, it's also been placed right on the edge of the curb on the concrete. The braces are on the far point of the block, and uh, uh, it could be a serious case of overturning with substantial force on those braces. So that was just really an example. But the uh, there is better guidance there in. Uh, part three, and um, I'm sure that's going to flow back in review to part two as well to get a little bit of um, a control over the use of uh, these sort of uh, ad hoc uh, footing arrangements. Um, the, uh, the the photograph on the right, uh, very skillful engineering here from a world leader in civil construction. Um, they uh, they decided that uh, rather than use that uh, do proper strip footings for these uh, sound walls that were going up uh, on a rail project um, they just thought well we don't want to we don't want to make the uh, walls unpretty by uh, drilling into them so we'll just come up with these little box configurations up the top and uh, use some LVLs and uh, just put some star pickets in and <laughs> the base for the footing and uh, no there had been no uh, analysis um, geotech analysis on the ground or whatever and you get a bit of rain and well you can see the results uh, there were there were other photos in that group where they, um, yeah, it was just outrageous what had been done, and uh, you know the argument at the time was, oh well, is uh, the Australian standards uh, not covered for this type of work, which uh, now it is. Um, the other issues I wanted to just quickly comment on: grouting of elements is seen by too many as an afterthought. Uh, go back some time, and I've seen. Uh, uh, blokes sent out by um, by uh, somebody to pack some grout into a panel that's already got another two levels on top of it and uh, already compressed the uh, the shim. So I don't know what they hope to achieve by doing that, but uh, we, we make it abundantly clear in the part three and we're going to make it in part two too that the grouting of elements and their connections is a part is a critical part of the installation process, not something to just be delayed and then uh, oh, we'll go back later and get a whole heap of them done together. Um, you know, time and tide has moved on again. No erection design um, uh, engineer. Sorry, can I go back to that, please, Simon? Just uh, I just want to make a comment. This is classic example of the biscuit join, the wet joins that Rod was talking about earlier. Um, in this particular one, uh, they. Uh, the, the, the idea was he got two bits of biscuit, I think they're about 800 mil, and then they just pour a slurry down between them. And uh, I asked for the design <laughs> because I couldn't work out what they'd done. But apparently, uh, I mean, there, there was no proper instruction on it. It was just, oh, yeah, put the panels up, then you just pour it down from the top. And the impact with which it hit, um, it, it actually split the um, – it split – along the pin line, the panel along the pin, pin line. And in the photo to the left, this is the same job five weeks later with the lift shaft, exactly the same thing happened. And all the instructions that 
Uh, I had given the company and the work cover inspector had come out. He'd instructed them to, and they just totally ignored it. And they just went on, you know, the dogs bark and the caravan moves on. So as a result, they had another incident. You can see what it did in the lift shaft. It, it will blow out um, the biscuit along, along the pin line of the panel. And that's exactly what happened in both those instances. And no erection design engineer. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to put this in, although, again, this one here on the left is another classic example of no erection design engineer uh, just left up to the form workers to do what they thought. You can see they've just poured it in from a great height. It's, it's pushed the, uh, the biscuit back and, and the, and the uh, slurry's just come out underneath it there. Uh, you wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have thought that it would have had the force to do that, but there you go. It certainly does. And the other photo here, and this is to do with damage and repair, uh, actually it's to do also with uh you know, the shop drawing being provided without proper approval by an erection design engineer. And this was a major tier one builder. Like I won't mention their name. I think it starts with a W, but um, 22 tonne panel sent to a job on a lean to and the rigging diagram on the drawing says that they hook it up for a rotate. It's got 32 mil starter bars coming out around the lifters and as it goes into rotate, the clutch assembly gets caught up on that recess there, on, on the starter bars on the recess, and the forces apply until eventually something gives. They saw rubble coming from the lifters, decided it wasn't a good idea to continue, reversed the, the rotation and back on the lean to. And then by the time I got out there, um, the, the manager, who, who wasn't a bad bloke, the, the site manager, but I said, have you got an erection design engineer here? No. Oh, what's that? So, again, if that had been done properly and an erection design engineer had looked at it, he would have known that there's no way you're going to be able to rotate it without getting caught up in the starter bars. But you go out to some jobs and people will take it upon themselves to just grind off the starter bars and they just do it. And there's been very little concentration on this issue of people just willy-nilly going around altering the design of a panel. The, the attitude was, oh, well, we'll just cut them off and just put it in place. Well, that's, part, that's been part of the design of the in-situ part of the building. So it, it's part of the tie-in. If you're going to, to uh, alter it, you're going to weaken it. It's as simple as that. So, you know, this again, if they had a been, if the builder concerned who I believe is fond of telling the world that they can contract who they want to do their uh, EDE functions. Um, maybe it would be a good start if they contracted someone to do it, you know. But anyway, we'll move on. Inspection and removal of supports. I, I won't go too far into it. We've, we've seen this before where uh, things, haven't been, things have been removed without being signed off and you end up having accidents. And um, these are just examples of it. And again, no erection design engineer, nobody doing the critical oversight of all the engineering for the erection of that particular um, construction. Again, that's that's uh, the incident out of, uh, I think it was uh, the ACT. Uh, again, another issue of uh, uh, removal of supports without uh, adequate time. No erection design engineer. Now, um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion on the committee and at this point it's only, it's, it's in for review, but I, I believe that we need to mandate minimum concrete strength for bracing off panels. Um, it's, you know, I think there was an argument that, oh, well, look, the engineer knows what he's doing and let him stipulate it. But we've had a runaway train with this stuff. It's a race to the bottom where, you know, some guys, some of them are engineers and some of them claim to be are going out, signing off on uh, appallingly low-strength concrete for the erection of precast and then bracing off uh, to that low-strength concrete. Um, and, you know, I, I know that some component suppliers think their components have magical qualities that, um, you know, are mysterious to the rest of the world that they know about. Uh, the simple fact is it's, in, it's imperative I feel it's imperative anyway that we establish a minimum 
uh, mandate a minimum concrete strength for bracing for both. Not only, I mean, we already say um, in the in the industry standard and the old national code that cast in, uh, sorry, that um, uh, expansion anchors uh, shouldn't be putting concrete under 20 MPa, but I think we need to stipulate a minimum concrete strength for the cast ins too, acknowledging acknowledging that. I mean, cast in is preferable to uh, post installed, but um, you know, if the concrete strength isn't up to a certain level and it's therefore unpredictable how it's going to behave, then I think we need to step up and, and mandate that. So that's something the committee are going to be considering in the review. And my final comment, I believe it is. Oh, no, second final comment. Sorry, just some... Uh, Look, we've tried everything, you know, we've been doing it for some time. You'll see that OHS alert still August 2014. Uh, every once in a while, you'll find some characters come along and said, oh, good to go at five or six MPA or eight MPA, whatever it might be. And then you, you find they haven't even done wind load, um, you know, computations and, and everything like that. So we've tried to do it, you know, without mandating, but I'm just afraid it's just not working. You know, and there's still characters out there just prepared to sign anything for the holy dollar. And uh, I think this will... Oh, no, it's the second last one again. Sorry, screw tight. Every few years, you get some character comes up with a nice, cheap solution, so they think, um, you know, to the, this sector of the industry. Screw type anchors um, are not appropriate for, for dynamic loads, you know, where... <laughs> They call, there's a reason they call braces push-pulls. They're the forces that are e exerted upon it. And, you know, I've, I mean, you can use these things out on the farm or whatever, you know, if you're just building a shed or whatever the case, but they are, and it is not a good idea to try and get away with using them to maintain um, a, a bracing on a, a, a I'd say, a 10-ton panel that uh, might be uh, 8 metres by 4 metres, act, acts as a big wind sail, and you've got this pushing and pulling, you know, push, pull, push, pull force on it. This thing, uh, in my opinion, wouldn't last too long at all. And I think it's outrageous that people are out there and saying, oh, they're good for, for anything. So, you know, if you if you hear, like, I, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to source the appropriate guidance material. But if you, you know, if, if you don't understand something, investigate it properly before you know, some salesperson says, oh, geez, these are cheap and they're good. Anyway, uh, this is the last one. Training. Uh, West Australia, as far as I'm aware, is the only state that mandates a course that you have to do for tilt up in West Australia. Uh, the Victorian branch, when I was there, uh, we our training unit pulled that, um, that uh, training module up we redesigned it to take into account more precast and uh, aspects of the precast sector from manufacturing through transport, storage, direction, et cetera, and incorporation. Um, that, that training, well, I mean, it was only a one-day course, an awareness course, uh, but that was uh, incredibly well favoured by membership of CFMEU, many of whom had worked in one side of the sector, maybe in manufacturing a precast or the other side in the erection but didn't know much about the other side. And by incorporating it all in together, it gives people a greater understanding of not only the complexity of what they've got to do, but the nature of the item. As I said, they're blind commodity, they come to sight. When I've taken riggers and dogmen around to precast plants to observe a panel before the pool, and I get a, a better appreciation of, oh, geez, it's not just a concrete block. It's got uh, mesh, it's got rio, it's got uh, casting componentry with the respective tension bars, it's got grout tubes, and it's got our centre of gravity and everything's been designed and engineered. And it, and it all starts, you just about see the light going off in their head. It all starts coming together for them. And I think it's imperative that all of the, all of the states, all of the jurisdictions, uh, adopt a mandate for training, just even on precast awareness. I know that National Precast have put a bit of work in recently with uh, other bodies to try and develop uh, training courses. Um, look, uh, you know, you could you could break off into areas and you know sub areas of the precast sector and 
uh, do some good training modules with it. But I do think we need to mandate, at the very least, this one-day precast awareness course across all jurisdictions and at least get the people doing the work in the industry a better understanding of what they're doing in, in what is could be a critical decision to be made in a hazardous industry. So, look, I think I'm pretty well... I hope I haven't bored the socks off anyone, but I've pretty well um, covered off the areas that uh, I, I wanted to comment on, and I'll, I'll save the rest of mine for um, any questions. So, well, I hope we've entertained you for the last hour. Um, the one thing that you'll hear that we've been banging on about and banging on about and banging on about is this erection design and the need for an erection design engineer. And it is actually the thing that is at the root of um, uh, good uh, engineering and building practice in prefabricated concrete construction. It's prefabricated concrete construction is not something that you can just turn up on the day and just you know, do, stick up some formwork and pour in some sloppy stuff with a bit of steel. No, it's got to be planned out properly first. It's got to be each of the, um, uh, the methods of, of, of building have to be thought about, uh, have to be planned, have to be designed, have to be engineered to ensure that everything's going to go together correctly. And if you do that planning up front and it's done properly and then supervised and you go according to plan, prefabricated concrete construction is the fastest construction that it's possible to do and therefore the, one of the most economic methods. So when you stop doing the planning and you leave it to somebody else to uh, have a hold up on site or they try and figure out what went wrong or what they've got to do, that's when you start taking away the economies of prefabricated concrete construction. So fundamental, it's about designing it, engineering it. Simon mentioned the fact that we've now specified roles as far as we can in Appendix uh, B in A3850 Part 3, and they will extend it to uh, Part 2. Um, those specified roles should be lifted from Part B and then used in contracts uh, to, to actually as requirements for, for uh, building construction because we've tried our very best to specify what we think are the qualities that people need to have. It's, it's all very well being a professional engineer, but you've also got to be a professional engineer with the right sort of experience. You can't be somebody who's just uh, attended engineering school, uh, jump out of engineering school, and then decide that you're going to be a wrecks and design engineer. You've got a lot of work to do if you think that um, that's engineering. Engineering is about learning on the job once you understand the principles. So we want this industry to lift its game in terms of professionalism, and it starts with the builders, starts with the principal contractors. They're the ones who are going to drive this process. They've got to insist on this erection design being done correctly, and the regulators have got to be in there making sure the people do it. And my one question that I have with the regulators is, why aren't you out there on every building site, do a random sample, go and see if they've got an erection design entity? If they haven't, they should be getting an improvement notice on the spot. If they don't have the requisite drawings, they're all there. It's 2015 that this standard was published. We're now six years on, and if there's any building site out there that does not have an erection design engineer and does not have those drawings on site, there should be no excuse, none whatsoever. They're putting people's lives at risk, whether they realise it or not. Well, there's no, there's no risk. So, Rod, Rod, can I interrupt there and just... Just add in too that what is also critical as well as obviously having an erection design engineer on the project is making sure that you're using a reputable precaster because too often price is the number one determinant for um, principal contractors in deciding on the precaster that they're going to use. Um, you are a lot less likely to not have an erection designer um, and to have a precaster who um, is going to have quality systems in place, safety systems in place, who has the right, the right uh, technical competence and facilities if you actually use uh, a, a, a reputable precaster, which is why we've introduced the Master Precaster Program where Master Precasters are actually audited across all of those areas plus their environmental performance to make sure that 
that they do know how to how to manufacture and they do understand the design, the transportation and the erection process. Um, so it's absolutely critical to not just use price as the key determinant of which precast are you going to use. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a holistic enterprise. And everybody in this industry needs to remember that that's the most important thing. It starts with the planning. It goes through to all the planning elements and cooperation and communication between the designers, the prefabricator, in other words, the precaster himself, first is going to do the erection and the erection crew. And so they've all got to be able to communicate together and that comes from the right sort of documentation trail uh, and an and uh, enthusiasm to make sure that they do it right. And Sarah's absolutely right. You know, if you don't have a, a, a precaster that's in control of his precasting operation, there's no way in which you're going to have a, an ability to be able to follow through with the, the correct design. So the designer relies on the precaster doing the right thing, as does everybody else. And Steve showed what happens when they don't, you know. When they don't have those quality systems. The issue too is it's often a case with the um, with the principal contractors that it's it's a case of they don't know what they don't know. Um, right. and, and they don't have the resources or the expertise to be able to... I was talking to actually the director of the um, Office of the Building Commissioner in New South Wales just this morning and we were talking about exactly that issue, that, that there isn't the expertise to know what to look for uh, in a precaster to determine whether they're actually suitable to supply precast. Oh, I think there is. The first start is they buy a copy of AS 3850 Part That's right. 1, 2 and 3. I don't think there's any excuse for anybody to say that they don't know. They do. They if should. A precaster they doesn't, shouldn't be using it. Absolutely. If a precaster doesn't know what AS 3850 is or what's in it, then don't touch them. And nor should a builder. That's right. That's it exactly starts with right. the builder. If the builder um, doesn't know... We've had a few questions come through. Um, so one question that's come up, and Steve touched on it with the awareness course uh, about training, what training is available. So obviously in Western Australia it is mandated to do that one-day uh, training course. Um, I'll also mention too that National Precast Online, which is a, a website, naturalprecastonline.com.au, um, we have developed an introduction to precast. Uh, course online course we've also got quite a good uh, grouting course there uh, and and Steve I think it was pointed out the 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 grouting's often left to the last minute and no one understands the importance of grouting and it's very common to see unfortunately to see two levels erected and someone comes in afterwards to do the the uh, grouting um, so so that we've got a guide for sale as well and a course that you can do which very clearly outlines the responsibilities of all parties in, um, in, erection, in erection when it comes to grouting. Um, we're, we're also developing additional online courses. And the other thing, Rod, you might want to mention is, is um, we're working with Artibus um, to develop a precast installation training. Yes, this is, a, uh, this is in its early days. Um, however, uh, Artibus is, has been contracted by the federal government, I understand, to put together a national training uh, modules for lifting, placing, uh, supporting and grouting and repair of uh, prefabricated concrete. Um, and I urge all of you uh, who um, uh, are interested in this area if you don't have uh, contact with Artibus to get in contact with Sarah, who can put you into, uh, into contact, there are uh, draft documents out already that both um, Simon and I have been um, uh, helping um, uh, on the assembly of. Um, and, of course, we, we don't know everything. And, you know, there could be some good things that you can put in there that will help everybody else, um, uh, the benefit of your knowledge. Um, there is some political sort of, um, I don't know, Argy bargy going on about this because um, it's said that this is going to be uh, a level three course now, you know, um, and, and that people might not want to pay for it or whatever. Um, but, you know, as Steve pointed out, you know, the, the, this issue about um, uh, knowledge and the lack of knowledge uh, by people out there uh, erecting precast uh, needs to be addressed. So somehow we've got to find the way and the path to actually get these people the education that they need to have to do this properly. So this is one step. 
So if you're interested, get in contact with Sarah and she can put you in the right my, direction. My email is exec at nationalprecast.com.au. Um, another question on uh, Queensland, the situation in Queensland where the code up there requires um, backup lifting systems to be used. So, uh, in other words, a secondary lifting system to be used for every precast concrete element that's lifted uh, and, and what the view is on that. I'll make some comments in, in a minute, but, um, but you guys might want to have a couple of words on it. Rod? Well, well. Uh, the committee uh, met two weeks ago, BD66 committee, um, and we once again agreed that um, uh, this is a bad idea. Um, and we've, uh, as a committee, we've written to the minister uh, involved in Queensland um, and advised um, her that um, of our opinion, which is a bad idea, uh, it should be removed from the current uh, code of practice up there. Um, in fact, it's... Uh, it's, it's a, uh, a suggestion um, born of right intentions, I think, um, to, uh, because there's a suggestion that Queensland workers need to be under, working underneath loads when they're being lifted and that they're, they're somehow they're different in Queensland than anybody else. No one else in Australia would dare walk under uh, any uh, uh, thing that's being lifted. Um, quite apart from anything else, if a load comes down because it's of overloading, um, because something breaks, um, it's much more preferable that the, that, that the load comes down than the load plus the crane comes down because if you try and catch the load whilst it's now uh, travelling uh, under the acceleration from gravity, uh, most people don't understand how, how severe that is. But uh, I did a small calculation and for a, uh, uh, an eight times factor is not um, uh, un impossible uh, for something that drops 100, 100 or 200 millimetres. It, it's a huge uh, multiplication factor. And we simply don't have those factors of safety in our cranes. So if you try and catch the load when it's falling, you're likely to bring the, the crane down. So now you're going to have the crane and the load on top of you. So why on earth would you stand? And it has been well shown, and there's a publication by New South Wales Safe Work, which was um, a study done at, uh, in conjunction with RMIT, uh, showing that the most likely cause of accidents in cranes is either structural failure of overhead cranes, gantry-type cranes, or well, any type of um, a gantry or a, um, a, um, uh, a luffing crane or a, or a, um, um, a trolley-type crane. They're, they're subject to structural failure generally. And mobile cranes, the next most um, frequent type of accident in a mobile crane is overturning. So if you're going to stand under the load, you're going to risk your life from the crane failing in a structural way or overturning, let alone something breaking in, in, in precast. And this whole issue has come about by putting in some backup lifting system, uh, but there's no history since 1990, since we first implemented ASC 850 and started putting tough rules around uh, lifting inserts and requirements for lifting, there have been very few uh, uh, loads dropped uh, as a result of insert failures. And in fact, loads dropped in general from cranes in that New South Wales study shows it's a very small proportion of the total number of crane failures. So you don't want to stand under a load because you don't want the crane to come down on top of you, much less a piece of precast concrete. So there are better ways of dealing with avoiding people um, and accidents under lifting under loads, and that is by implementing proper exclusion zones to make sure people don't go there, and then making sure that people follow the advice and, uh, and, and ensure that they've got swims in place to make sure that they're not there when they're not supposed to be there. Simon, did you, did you want to add anything there? Well, the only thing I wanted to add, and I think Rod's pretty well covered it, is that we have made a suggestion that BD66 gets involved with uh, Queensland Safe Work uh, or WorkSafe to actually assist because we've got a lot of experienced people and, uh, and I think that's how we spent a lot of time. We spent about a year in the committee dealing with Safe Work Australia to put the National Code of Practice together and I think that's a sensible option to, to come up with a result that's suitable for the industry as a whole. But yeah, we're, we're, looking, we're, looking, we're actually looking forward to work with them and uh, I've been told that... Um, uh, by one of the senior people there, that they intend to put uh, a representative on BD66, which would be a terrific step forward, in my opinion. The chairman's right. actually written to the office, I think, in the minister. 
Um, Steve, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, look, uh, look whilst the CFNEU at this stage doesn't have a national position on this, so mm. I can only co uh, comment as a committee member, but um, I see all sorts of problems with this. I have raised issues about it in the past, and I just haven't been satisfied that any of the arguments put forward stack up. Um, I think that there's problems with it from the manufacturing side. Uh, you know, some of these uh, panels and elements are that complicated now. The architects get their pound of flesh out of the engineers, so to speak. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult as it is now with some of the odd shapes and the nature of some of the elements to, you know, uh, have your, your proper lifting systems in place and your centre of gravity and everything sorted out. So there's problems from the manufacturing side, and I can see elements where it would just be impossible to put another set of lifters and tension bars and that within the element without compromising concrete cover and other safety factors in it. Um, I think there's issues about uh, restraint in erection. Uh, you certainly can't rotate a panel with two rigging systems on it. Uh, I don't care what people say they can do. Um, and... Uh, I think also there's there's other safe uh, other safety considerations that may not be immediately apparent, but in my experience in in the industry, um, I think something like that gives people a false sense of security, and then you get a, a breakout of other bad practices, such as people, uh, you know, milling around like browns cows when loads going overhead. You know, I, I think that we'd be far better served by implementing the, the, the provisions that are in there now. And that is to design these things properly, to have proper engineering oversight, to have manufacturers that have proper QA systems and uh, make sure their workers um, uh, manufacture, uh, you know, do proper uh, vibration around uh, castings and, and that to make sure you have pro proper settlement of the concrete and you don't have honeycombing and that, which is, you know, a bad manufacturing error. I think one of my photographs earlier was uh, manufactured spline supplied a, a uh, rotating panel that you could put your fist in behind a seven-ton lifter. There was that much air in it. So um, I think that they're the areas that we need to concentrate on rather than I, I think the term that was used by Rod at one stage was it's a, pro it's a solution in search of a problem. So, look, I, no, they're, they're my concerns. I haven't heard anything in the last couple of years that have um, uh, alleviated any, any of my concerns. And... Um, I, I suppose, as I said, I'm only speaking as a committee member at this stage. The CFMEU will no doubt have debate within their forums uh, in, into the future, and I'm sure all the issues will be aired there. But uh, in, the, in the experience I've had in safety and that over the last 10 years, I, I just can't see the, you know, it being a valid way of dealing with an issue. No, and in fact, it's causing increased safety risk and it's, it's causing an increased risk of, um, of there being a failure. So Essentially, there shouldn't be anybody in the flight path. No. You know, when, as soon as, as, soon as the, the signal is given to lift, and that signal should only be given by uh, the, the rigger who's controlling the, 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 the hookup process, uh, until the area has been cleared and that flight path has been uh, cleared, you can't... Take your plane, just like in an aeroplane, you can't take an aeroplane off the runway until you're cleared to go. So once you're cleared to go, you can take your aeroplane off. I used to fly aeroplanes, so I know a bit about this. And then you go along the track on the flight path and there shouldn't be anybody underneath there. Now, there's some argument, of course, as to saying, well, what happens when you're 10 levels up and are you allowed to have somebody working three levels down? Well, I think that's an engineering decision that's got to be um, well worked out with all of those involved. Um, but having said that, anybody who's directly under the flight path shouldn't be there. Um, and, I mean, it's just common sense. Come on. Look, can I just add it further, Rod? I first came across this some years ago when a, a, a character told me that uh, in Queensland you can lift loads over people as long as you've got a secondary lift system. And I said, I, I didn't think it was true. <laughs> I'd, I'd never heard of that. All the guidance material from the Australians to the AS2550 for cranes, and anything that I've ever read about craneage uh, on a site, you do not lift loads over people full stop. The regulation is prohibited, Steve. Yeah. The regulations, so the current regulations in Queensland prohibit it. No, so, I, every, I think everywhere they do. Every and, jurisdiction. 
you know, I, that, I, that's an important message I think that we send out, and I know we've run over over time a little bit, but it is an important point to make, and it's come out as a, as a result of this issue in Queensland. We're certainly taking the position of opposing and and requesting the removal from the Office of Industrial Relations as well as the Minister. Uh, and I know that the chairman of the of BD66 committee has written similarly to to both. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward with that one. Um, two more questions very quickly. Uh, is there any guidance on lifting anchor capacities after fire testing in temperatures heated to 1,100 degrees, then cooled to ambient temperature? No. No? Okay. There's a short answer to that one. And then the other question I will uh, quickly read out. My company does a large amount of proof engineering reviews on precast anchors in accordance with 3850 Part 1. A number of suppliers are using the CDD design method to calculate their anchor capacities rather than the calculations in 3850 Part 1, Appendix B. Is the CDD design method a valid approach and is it compliant with Part 1 uh, as it is not referenced in the code? Yes, it is. I can answer that. Um, the CCD, which is the Concrete Capacity Design Method, um, is the internationally recognised uh, design method. And the Appendix B in 3850 was specifically written to comply with the requirements of the CCD method. Uh, there was some uh, adjustment uh, to that design method to allow for um, uh, the case where the CCD method um, cannot be used directly the CCD method only uh, gives you the concrete capacity um, and does not take into consideration any uh, effects of steel. Generally, the CCD method uh, for anything that's lifted out of a face uh, where the, and in a thin panel, if you like, out of the face, where there's not substantial vertical reinforcing or vertic uh, uh, reinforcing which is um, parallel to the axis of, of, of the, the load, in other words, directly out of the panel. Uh, if, that, if there's no uh, significant amount of confinement from uh, that type of uh, reinforcing, then the resistance is totally dependent on the concrete capacity. As you get a deeper embedment and you surround it with more reinforcing, and if that reinforcement is there fully embedded and therefore can be developed within that, the, the embedment depth of the anchorage that you've got, then the CCD method becomes uh, overly conservative um, and you really need to test them. AS3850 part one allows you to test and put what's called a beta factor against uh, the CCD method to allow for those sort of situations. In general, you can use the CCD method for any situation uh, on the conservative side. Uh, it can be restrictive if you're looking at um, anchors in thin panels, anchors of a long embedment depth for the sorts of reasons I've talked about. If somebody wants more information, I'm more than happy to provide it. Probably well, the only other little comment on that is that it is it is only for concrete, and I think it's above 12 MPA, so not for, for very low strength concretes. Thank you very much. So I think we'll wrap up today's webinar and I will thank our panellists and speakers. Thank you very much to Steve, to Simon and Rod. I think we've all had a great outline of 3850 and you've certainly pointed out the key, the key learnings and key takeaways from it to, um, to ensure uh, a low-risk um, experience when you're using precast concrete. So thank you all very much for today. This um, recording will be made available to participants, to registered participants. It will also be made available for free to members of National Precast and others will be able to, uh, for a small fee, um, buy it and watch it. So thank you uh, very much to our presenters and thank you all uh, to our audience for participating in today's webinar. Thanks. Can I have one parting shot? <laughs> Always, Rod. <laughs> Go and get a copy of AS3850 Part 1, 2 and 3 if you're involved in Precast copy. because you need it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Good you very you, much. No worries. Thanks, thanks, thanks. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.